Now, the way I want to frame today's conversation is to begin by asking, I want to frame the, the way in which von Hildebrand proceeds in this chapter by raising a number of questions. So, for example, why, why does beauty have the ability to elevate us, to break us out of our world? Why does it have the ability to lift us beyond our, our mediocrity, perhaps? Why do we, many of us, have experiences of moral or religious awakening, even opening us to religious faith? Now, I don't ask these questions as leading questions. I ask them because I think that they speak to some extent to the experiences all of us have. I think they probably explain many of the motives of why we're here. This chapter is part of Van Hildebrand's answer to that question. Now, I want to, before delving into this chapter with you, which I think is one of the most significant in the, in the work, make a, a few preliminary comments uh, that I think have a bearing on the entire work of the seminar. So the first is that it's very important that we not read Hildebrand's aesthetics as a kind of endorsed list of works of art. Um, that's not to say that he doesn't offer works that many of us identify with as being significantly beautiful, but they obviously reflect a certain time and place, a certain background, a certain biography. He was born in Florence at the turn of the century, raised in an extraordinary artistic household. Uh, you know, in some ways, uh, the examples are, are in part typical of the time. Uh, again, that's not to say they're not really beautiful, but for those of us who today, especially those of you who are artists who are interested in finding ways of developing your own voice, finding a vocabulary, a, contempor a contemporary vocabulary that in some sense connects with what we understand to be beautiful, but also allows us to speak in our own voice today, that may not seem sufficient. Now, I, I think that that is, it's an easy thing to happen, and it, it easily happens reading this work because it's so full of these examples, but it's basically a mistake, and, and at the end of the day, it's somehow not in keeping with von Hildebrand's own phenomenological approach. What, I, what do I mean by phenomenology here? Well, the, uh, Hildebrand uh, is phenomenological in many ways, but I want to I highlight just a few here. So first of all, you have a, 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 you have a mode of argumentation that is not primarily one of proof, as one might expect in a philosophical work. The, the German word for proof is Beweis. Uh, in phenomenology, one often speaks of Aufweis, which means something like bringing to evidence. And so in von Hildebrand, you have often these, 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 these lengthy passages in which he's trying to bring to evidence a fundamental phenomenon or datum. Now, often interwoven in that process of bringing to evidence are these examples of which I was just speaking. But one has to somehow separate the examples from this process of bringing to evidence. Otherwise, I think we risk not even really taking seriously his philosophical contributions. We end up sort of reading, you know, a philosophical, a philosophical account that will be insightful in some ways of works that maybe we love or maybe we don't love. That's not really the purpose of a philosophical aesthetics. One more preliminary point, which I know has been helpful in at least one small group I heard about, and it's, it's a point that perhaps is not clearly enough underlined in the aesthetics by von Hildebrand, but it's very much present throughout. And that is the distinction between beauty as an aesthetic value and all other aesthetic values, which are not necessarily beauty itself. So what do I mean? Well, in many of the discussions, people have raised things like, what about the phenomenon of the comic or the ironic? Or what about the juxtaposition of beauty and ugliness that can have a significant aesthetic value in a work? Well, Van Hildebrand wouldn't deny that at all. In fact, he would, in fact, many of the chapters are devoted to some of these non-beauty aesthetic phenomena, aesthetic values. But the reason it's so important is because it immensely widens the horizon of what we're talking about. We, we can think of, it, because if we think of everything as somehow being a subset of beauty, uh, it becomes very difficult to do justice to all of these things that just are obviously not themselves a form of beauty. And, uh, I think we can all think of examples. I, uh, as a musician myself, uh, tend to think in, in musical terms, but this one I think can be done both in musical and, and literary terms. 
If you think about the, the music of someone like Shostakovich, uh, great 20th century composer under communism, there you have someone who lived uh, in a, uh, a world with a cultural, ministry, a cultural ministry that engaged in heavy censorship, uh, that uh, the, the story of his life is extraordinary, essentially the state of house arrest that he lived under, um, anything that was in any way thought to be subversive of the official aesthetic and political platform uh, was, was, was held in suspicion. So you have this sort of intense environment in which an artist like Shostakovich is working um, that, that, uh, that limits perhaps ordinary expressions uh, of, in fact, even the, uh, he, he might have written, let's just say, in a more obvious idiom of traditional beauty had he not had to write under communism. So what he uses are, uh, in musical terms, are things like sarcasm and irony and innuendo. At the same time, these, these, uh, these things given in a very musical way, in a fully musical way, are juxtaposed with very beautiful and soaring moments, things that we would all, I think, ordinarily want to describe as beauty. And so we have then these poignant moments because somehow it's all within an acceptable language. And at the same time, it's, it not only is it mocking it through its irony and its sarcasm, but it's somehow transcending it by finding ways of allowing beauty back into the to the language that Shostakovich developed. I, when I think of literature, I think of people like Solzhenitsyn, who also engaged in a tremendous use of irony and sarcasm, but manage in the, 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 in the human pathos of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the literary world that he created to often, uh, in some sense, accentuate human and even transcendent beauty through this juxtaposition. So I underscore this because I think that uh, as soon as we think that we're only talking about beauty when we're speaking about aesthetics, we're in fact, we're, 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 we, we, there's a kind of unsound foundation that will continue to undermine our discussions. Now, what I would propose we do as we read this chapter about the spiritual plenitude of beauty of the second power, or let's just call it of beauty, is that we actually each supply our own examples of beauty, which is to say as we work through the text here that each of you think rather than of the examples or trying to Google the images, the Gulf of Spezia, which he likes to talk about, or the Medici tombs of Michelangelo, think of what it is that to you is beauty in its highest form. And, and I know that that will, that will cover a spectrum of art forms, it will cover art and nature, it will cover uh, uh, re religious and spiritual realities, perhaps moral virtues, I, I would encourage you to think of things that are of an artistic nature, or at least, shall we say, things in the visible and the audible, because this is really what von Hildebrand is talking about. So um, let's perhaps think in, in those terms. Um, and having made this distinction between aesthetic values, or let's say between beauty as an aesthetic value and all the other aesthetic values, think of something that comes as close to being primarily about beauty. And this is not because I think it this is really just so that we can read the text with, with great sympathy. Now, I'm going to do one little thing here, which is at least give you my example of what I think to be a work of exquisite beauty. And I'm not saying you have to agree with it, but it captures some of the things that I know that all of us, when we talk about beauty, we tend to, do, we tend to sort of fall into, into similar descriptive language. We speak about things that move us. We think about things that there's an uplift. We think about perhaps a soaring moment, a release from the burdens of, of daily life. We think about a contemplative element, perhaps. So these are things that I think are at least obviously present in this example. So uh, it's only one minute and 10 seconds long. So that's pretty impressive, um, but it's a very memorable one minute. So let's hear it, and then uh, we'll move directly into the text. <laughs> 
tell you afterwards what that is. Um, what's very interesting about it, for those of us who've been discussing this problem of a canon that supposedly uh, can have oppressive tendencies, is that this great work has gone from being celebrated to rejected to rediscovered to celebrated to, re to rejected and so on and so forth as, um, as different, great different great conductors have um, brought the work back into circulation. And I find that interesting because it, it's, it, it demonstrates how even a canon um, is not somehow a fixed canon, that the canon itself comes and goes. But the main point here is just to offer you a work that, that um, perhaps doesn't include these other aesthetic values of which I speak. There's no irony in this. There's a great unaffected sincerity and directness. And I have to say that this is one of those works that um, uh, it, it simply, I don't want to say it works, um, but it always has a, a kind of common effect in the concert hall, which is that it simply moves and transfix pe transfixes people. Now, let's finally get to von Hildebrand's proposal in this chapter, uh, which is again about the spiritual plenitude, as he calls it, of beauty. Now, <clears throat> let me just underscore that I want to put this out there for all of you to consider it as a, uh, a thesis that von Hildebrand offers. I, I personally find much of it very compelling. I don't know if the argument is complete. And, uh, and in fact, this, this chapter is somehow typical of much in the work, which is that there's a, there seems to be a kind of core insight uh, that still requires further development. So the good news is that there's a lot of work to be done uh, for those of us who think there's something here. So in sum, the, the thesis that he makes um, is that in the experience of beauty uh, is co-given, are co-given other values that are not beauty itself. And there, these other values are like aspects of beauty. Um, that's not the word he uses, but perhaps that helps you understand it. And when I say co-given, what I mean is that in the experience of beauty, the theme may be the beautiful, but then there are these other values that von Hildebrand says are there, and they add to the richness of the work. Now, what's very interesting about the, the way in which he arrives at this claim is that he works it out from the point of view of what he says are the antitheses of beauty. So he wants to say that things like mediocrity, or the prosaic, or the superficial, the flat, the trite, the ungenuine, the sentimental understood in the form of kitsch, that these things are all, if not the primary opposite of beauty, they nevertheless form an antithesis to beauty, and that beauty, the, f the more fully it is present, the more fully does it stand in a kind of uh, of judgment even upon these things. Um, there is an interesting, you know, we, we've been talking about the problem of binary concepts here, but it's very significant that the use of the, the idea of antithesis here uh, deepens our sense of the thing itself, so to speak. So the antithesis of beauty sheds light on what beauty is, says von Hildebrand. The there's more that he says uh, that I think we can put aside. Those of you who've read the text carefully may want to ask questions about uh, some of the contrasts he makes with metaphysical beauty, but let's just pursue this idea that in the givenness of beauty uh, is also a great plenitude uh, that is experienced in the way in which it stands in contrast to these other values. He, go he makes uh, one point uh, a little bit later on, that this isn't something you think of. You don't think that music is, is uh, the antithesis to mediocrity, but he says somehow that you feel a kind of spiritual strength and abundance, uh, and that this in turn has to do with why music has this power over us, or not music, beauty in whatever form it may be. Now, I'd like to read to you, because it's done so expressively, first his character is that we're gonna do two of these. We'll do the mediocre and the sentimental. Um, I'd like to read to you how he characterizes the mediocre, and then we're going to look at a false antithesis, and then we're going to look at the real, antith and the real antithesis, which is in beauty. So um, let's look through it. I think it will become more clear. Those of you who have the reader, it would be on page 228. So he says, oh, sorry, 95 in the reader. I'm, and I'm going to skip a little bit, but if you want to know where, uh, where I am, you can come here. So he says, an element contained in beauty is the antithesis to all mediocrity, to the Philistine and the bourgeois. 
Ernst Elo says that there is nothing the mediocre person hates as much as beauty. And then he says, it is remarkable that the beauty of the visible and the audible can possess the fullness, height, and depth. Oh, excuse me. He says, the special value of the freedom of spirit and breadth, which constitutes an antithesis to the quality of the mediocre, the Philistine and the bourgeois, is one of the elements contained in beauty. Naturally, this applies equally to metaphysical beauty. It is remarkable that the beauty of the visible and the audible can also possess this fullness, height, and depth. The freedom and breadth, this freedom and breadth, live in the beauty of nature and of great works of art. They are the opposite of all that is mediocre, Philistine, and bourgeois. This is why, as Elo says, the mediocre person hates beauty. He senses that it implicitly contains a verdict on the terrible disvalue of his attitude of mind. And then, uh, on page 95, or sorry, 96, Van Hildebrand makes this interesting proposal, which is part of what I think we have to consider maybe sort of in the background, namely that he, uh, you'll note that all of these, these, these negative values that he describes are most highly embodied in persons or in attitudes of mind, or as he says, in philosophies or schools of thought. So it's, it's remarkable that he identifies these antitheses not in abstract things, but in things that are most fully realized in the human world. I think that's very significant. So he says here, in order to understand the common element in mediocrity, and by the way, he said mediocrity has to be distinguished from the average. He wants to say that, uh, you know, a mediocre person in the sense of simply an average person. He wants to say that there's a hostility to beauty in the mediocrity that he has in mind. He says here, in order to understand the common element in mediocrity, in the Philistine, in the bourgeois, we must, of course, take our starting point in the human being to whom we ascribe these predicates. This is the person who looks at all values in a diminutive way. He does not deny them, but he interprets them in a, in a way which deprives them of all greatness, of all that is absolute and unconditional. The mediocre person evades the demand made by values. He does not want to rebel against them, but he is willing to get involved with them only up to a certain degree. The Philistine hates everything that is unconditional, he never wants to leave his warm nest or lose the solid ground under his feet. In keeping with his basic attitude, he regards all that is unconditional and heroic, all glowing enthusiasm, and the total gift of oneself as exaggerated. He does not wish to utter either a Promethean protest against the world of values and ultimately against God, or to commit himself genuinely to them. And below he says he wants to remain on the golden middle ground in every sphere of life. He wants to be rational as he understands the term. So there you have Van Hildebrand's characterization of mediocrity. Uh, the, uh, let's look now at the, what he calls a kind of pseudo-antithesis. So he recognizes that people uh, want to set themselves against mediocrity in various ways, and many people... Uh, find a lot to condemn in mediocre people and in ideas, and including in Christian and religious communities. It's often the reason for leaving. And he wants to say that uh, there are these various antitheses that form a kind of appearance of antithesis, but they're not really essentially opposed to mediocrity. In fact, they're a form of mediocrity itself. So he says that aestheticism is a type of false antithesis to mediocrity because Fundamentally, aestheticism doesn't really take beauty seriously. It takes it as a form, uh, a sophisticated, highly refined pleasure. So it misses the entire point. He says in one place here, on 97, apart from the arrogance, which is a factor in many of those who want to be one of the cultivated class, there is also an escape into a flimsy pseudoculture, which does indeed constitute an antithesis of the mediocre, but it is a false antithesis. I think this is uh, a very significant contrast that he makes, and probably one that in the artistic world uh, we have to be careful of, even ourselves. And certainly when we want to be relevant and be taken seriously, we have to recognize that in the, the art world, much of, what, what, much of what's happening there is often fundamentally aestheticist in nature. So we have to be careful, in any case, about how we try to achieve relevance. Now, moving forward, the true antithesis to mediocrity very striking. Van Hildebrand doesn't go sort of first into a characterization of qualities. He looks at persons, and he looks at great, outstanding persons. In fact, he highlights Kierkegaard, and then he looks at a number of significant thinkers. And I just want to read to you, again, because it's very powerful in his own formulation, what he says. So, 99, 
the second on the page 236 in the text, he says, the thinkers who are the true antitheses of mediocrity and of the Philistine bourgeois mentality are Plato, Augustine, Pascal, and Kierkegaard. And he doesn't mean only them, he means in a particular way. What a contrast to all mediocrity we find in every Platonic dialogue, in the atmosphere of truth, reverence, of the true sursum corda, the lifting up of our hearts. Kierkegaard says that one attains to the true self in the true and wholesome losing of oneself, which is the opposite of the enslavement by the passions. This holy madness, unlike the sick madness, deals the death blow to mediocrity, which is never willing to step outside its nice, neat, little warm nest. And he says of Augustine, in the confession Saint Augustine, of St. Augustine, we're embraced by the breadth of the true God, by ultimate greatness, breadth, and absoluteness, a total gift of self, all of which are radical antitheses to mediocrity and Philistine narrowness. This is why mediocre spirits nourish a special hatred for this work and regard it as the prototype of exaggeration, of knowing no boundaries, of going too far. Now, he takes this characterization of mediocrity as an attitude of mind, and then the contrary of me mediocrity in these great figures. So if mediocrity is half-hearted, uncommitted living, in the presence of great values, we have in these figures various modes of deep and total commitment to great goods and values. Now he wants to bring this back to the idea of beauty. He says, in our present context, this is page 100, it is important to grasp that the beauty of, uh, the, beauty of the second power also contains a qualitative antithesis to the mediocre, the Philistine and the bourgeois, since it radiates an atmosphere of true breadth and true freedom. This is not only the case when this element plays a role in terms of content, as for example when the great truth in a literary work of art or the elevating moral character of a figure in a drama contributes to this element of the anti-bourgeois, the anti-mediocre. It applies equally to the purely qualitative antithesis between the beauty of the second power and the oppressive atmosphere of the mediocre. So he would say that the piece that I played for you beforehand, of which most, unless you know German, you don't know, um, or unless you know the piece, you wouldn't have known the words. So you're hearing it really just as a piece of music, um, as opposed to knowing what else, might be, be, uh, what else might be communicated. He would say that in this work, one has uh, precisely the, for example, he would say that it, that, that it is characterized by an inner freedom. There's nothing cramped about it. There's a soaring quality. There is no hesitation in it. There's, there's an uplifting quality. There's a lightness. There's a, a release from, from tension, uh, though not an unserious release. So he wants to say that beauty in all of its different manifestations, not just in the work I presented, and I'm hoping that in the examples you've all selected for your own personal example, that you would say that yes, in that, in those works, is a kind of um, more than just formal difference with mediocrity, or, or something that isn't just on a scale, it's not just better than the mediocre work, but there is this, there is this sort of inner tension uh, between the reality of mediocrity and beauty as experienced in those works. Again, he said, I, I mentioned earlier, this gets into the more questions of how, how this happens and how we know it, but he has an interesting passage here on sort of how, how this factors into our experience. Uh, this experience of the, uh, how these antitheses show up in our experience. He says the following, no one who experiences this beauty will think immediately of the antithesis to these disvalues, but he will feel and apprehend the special quality which is the objective antithesis of the mediocre and the Philistine, and it will take hold of him. He will apprehend the inexhaustible richness of spirit, the seriousness and the greatness which lives in beauty in purely qualitative terms. So, and then he goes on to say that beauty, purely as beauty, contains this whole range of spiritual values. And as I was thinking about this, I was asking myself about, say, the, the, the moral sphere. And it has to be said that even when uh, the saintly person, or when, when we try to do good, uh, maybe in our philosophical moments we say, well, we're living the good life, or we're trying to flourish. Um, and probably that doesn't factor in when we try to be a good parent, at least not in the moment, or a good husband or a good spouse. Um, but at the same time, it would be incorrect to say that the moral life, uh, even the choosing of good, involves no consciousness of the alternative. Uh, there is a sense always that 
there are choices at our disposal. And in general, it's not necessarily the choice between good and evil, but it's the choice between what we think we ought to do and what we perhaps want to do or attempted to do. So that this antithesis certainly intrudes into our experience, even if it's not articulated the way Van Hildebrand offers. He wants to say because it's objective, objectively in the nature of beauty, that beauty is opposed to mediocrity, that it inevitably impresses itself on us in our experience of beautiful things. Let's take a look at his discussion of the sentimental, which is, by the way, part of a, a larger discussion of the ungenuine. And uh, this is a very rich passage. I, uh, we won't have time to discuss it all. And on today's panel on beauty and contemporary art, I want to pick up on what he says on the phenomenon of kitsch a little bit more carefully, since this has been so important in contemporary art. But let's just look again at his proposal here which is that beauty contains values that are not reducible to beauty, and that these values form these objective antitheses to things, and that these antitheses have to do with the power of beauty in our lives. So the first thing he says when he speaks about sentimentality is he doesn't mean exaggerated emotion. Uh, he doesn't mean uh, the high-strung person, the person who falls into, uh, into emotional outbursts. There, there may be problems, there are problems, of course, with there are other uh, emotional illnesses and imperfections uh, other than the problem of sentimentality as he understands it. He characterizes it in a very particular way. Uh, reading from 101 on the second half of the page, he says, well, I'll skip around a bit, but that's where I'm heading. He says, the beauty of the second power in the realm of the visible and the audible also contains an antithesis to the sentimental. The characteristic of sentimentality is that the real theme is a certain softening, a delight in swimming in an ungenuine emotionality. The sentimental person never dedicates himself truly to the object. The object, a particular event, the action of another, of another person or another human being is not the theme but only a means to elicit a pseudo-emotion which the sentimental person enjoys. For him, the theme is the pseudo-emotion which is a world away from genuine emotion. The quality of this emotion is ungenuine. It is false. It is a false, qualitatively perverted affectivity, not, on, not at all an exaggerated sensitivity, and still less a mere predominance of the emotional vis-a-vis -vis reason and will. It is an error that goes in a completely different direction. So you can see some parallels there with the idea of, the, of, the, uh, of, of aestheticism, that in aestheticism, the beauty as the object of our experience is sort of replaced uh, with, well, beauty rather than being the object of our aesthetic experience becomes a kind of prompt for emotional responses, uh, including very refined emotional responses that we enjoy. Now, let's see here, I wanted to read one more. It has all of these wonderful... Sometimes it's a bit overwhelming, the sheer number of examples and subsets of examples that he offers. So you can, I, I just direct you to the text if you want to, uh, to read this uh, more extensively. That is to say, the characterization of, of sentimentality. And then again, he looks at various pseudo-antitheses, things that are not really, in the end, the opposite of sentimentality. Uh, but let, in light of time, let's look at his characterization of the opposite of real, the, the real alternative, the real antithesis to sentimentality in this soft, self-centered sense. On page 103, he says, the true antithesis to sentimentality is the genuine affectivity which we find, for example, in a great love, like that between Lenore and Florestan in Beethoven's opera Fidelio, so I guess here we're reaching for one of his examples, uh, or between Tristan and Isolde in Wagner's opera of the name. Here's a uh, an example many of us will, will more directly relate to. He says, in a deep and grateful joy whose highest form finds its expression in the age Simeon's nunc dementis, now do you dismiss your servant, O Lord, that I may depart in peace. So he thinks that in, that, in those words of Simeon is a high and other-centered, object-centered affectivity. Obviously, it's deeply felt. In the deep and noble experience of being moved by a sublime beauty or in the tears caused by repentance or deep pain or deep joy, 
The important point in the present context is to grasp that the beauty of the second power is incompatible with sentimentality, and that although it, this is not its theme, it contains an antithesis to all sentimentality. The interesting thing here is not only that the expressed ethos where this occurs in a work of art that is supposed to be beautiful must never be sentimental, but also that beauty as such contains an antithesis to the sentimental. So what he means there is that, again, the beauty is not the primary opposite of sentimentality. It would be genuine affectivity. That's the primary antithesis to beauty, but he wants to, uh, the primary antithesis to this uh, distorted sentimentality, but he wants to say that beauty in the second power, or again, we should just say beauty simply, stands also in antithesis to this false sentimentality. So when a work of art evokes sentimentality in that, in that, in that, in that sense, in, uh, and, and I don't mean when someone abuses it in the form of the esti, but when it, when, when it can't but evoke that kind of emotion in us, then Hildebrand would say it is lacking in beauty, because beauty is simply not compatible with this kind of sentimentality. He, he, I'll end here just by, by reading briefly what he says about kitsch, because kitsch, of course, is one of these, these pseudo-alternatives to, uh, to sentimentality because it presents itself as beautiful. It sort of seeks to be the real thing. It's a, it's a, it's a substitute. And he says, unlike the ugly, the trivial claims to be beautiful. And he means also, by trivial, he means kitsch here now. He says, he says the metaphysical, no, no, let me just skip all of this. He says, the trivial, which plays a great role above all in art is a pseudo-beauty. It lies. It passes itself off as beautiful, but it rings false. Not only does beauty possess the qualitative antithesis to the prosaic, the mediocre, the shallow, and the ungenuine, the beauty of the second power in art is the thematic opposite of the trivial, in a manner analogous to the relationship between metaphysical beauty and metaphysical ugliness. So he wants to say that here you have simply a direct antithesis, beauty and triviality. Beauty and kitsch are, in fact, the direct opposite of one another. So let me simply end here by sort of summarizing again the, the, the proposal that von Hildebrand makes, and I think in our discussion it will be interesting to know what you all think about it, which again is that, um, I, I'll put it to you like this. Yesterday, we spoke about beauty of the second power, and we spoke about this mysterious discrepancy between the bearer, which is uh, of a low value in von Hildebrand's sense, and beauty, which has this transcendent dimension, uh, which can't be exclaimed, explained by reference to the bearer. We had a lot of discussion about that. There, there, there was perhaps some, some dissatisfaction with the, the idea that it's just a mystery. Well, what, what might this, uh, what, what more can we say about beauty? Is there not something qualitative we can say? Well, in this chapter, we, we begin to see von Hildebrand's answer. The mystery is not that beauty is somehow empty of content or empty of a quality. The mystery is in this ability of, of material reality to reveal a higher world, that it can be a signal of transcendence. The actual quality of beauty, though, as von Hildebrand has been fleshing out here, is very sp specific and can be characterized. If we can really say that beauty stands in antithesis to mediocrity, to the prosaic, to triviality, to superficiality, to kitsch, then we, we know quite a lot about what beauty is and what its nature and its essence would be.